Greetings and welcome, beloved, to You Have Your Bibles broadcast. We thank the Lord for those of you who are joining in with us live and certainly for those of you who will view this at the appointed time. This is session five of Evangelism, Perfecting the Saints. And we're here in the Gospel of John, John chapter one. And we're going to lift verse 40 and 41 in your hearing. One of the two which heard John speak and followed him was Andrew, Simon Peter's brother. He first findeth his own brother, Simon, and saith unto him, we have found the Messiah, which is being interpreted, the Christ. Our Father in heaven, we thank you now for this day and for these next few moments that we will share uh, with this audience. We thank you for the privilege of being able to do so. We ask now that you would fill us with your spirit, with wisdom and knowledge, strength and courage to speak the truth in love, be glorified and exalted through your dear son, the Lord Jesus will give you, even now, all of the glory, praise and honor for it. In Christ Jesus' name, amen. Our closing remarks on last evening we raised an inspection uh, that was part of the message in the way that we uh, set it up is that the Lord has not called us to clean fish that we have yet to catch. And that is one of the serious issues within the life of the local New Testament church where we have pronounced salvation upon those who are yet in their sins. We have church school and Bible study, small group sessions, and we find ourselves spending a lot of time spinning our wheels, teaching those who are yet unconverted. They are disconnected from uh, the teaching. They are not responsive to the preaching. Church is somewhere that they go. A meeting is something that they attend. True evangelism has to have at its core uh, the mission of Christ to reach the lost. And we're not able to do that in the arm of the flesh. Because when we do, we will uh, have people to join our ranks, uh, spend time with us, and about all they get worked up over is something that has something to do with the flesh. And then the other observation that I know is a critical inspection point is those within uh, the church who have a, a very critical spirit. They can walk into a room and rather than see things for what it is, the, the blessing of being able to share in another day with their brothers and sisters, but come in and, and find fault with things and find fault with people. And beloved, if you are a child of God and you have a critical spirit, it's going to ooze out in your evangelism. You can't hide it. It will prevent you from being used fully by the Spirit of God. Evangelism must be done 
under the auspices of the Holy Spirit. We have to be so far removed from the equation. We are the, the channel. We don't lose our uniqueness, but we don't get in the way by saying things that will not add to the mission of winning souls. That's the most important part of the service. Once we have taught the word and preached the gospel, or once we have uh, shared Christ one-on-one -on -one or in a small group or whatever the case may be, when it comes time for individuals to uh, come under the power of the Holy Spirit to convict them of sin and of righteousness and of judgment, that's a critical and a crucial time. And we have to choose our words carefully. But if you have a critical spirit, I heard the preacher say yesterday, you, you wear it. It's like a garment on you. To be honest, that's going to be an Achilles heel for winning souls. It'll be difficult to do because we'll drive people away from us the very people that we need to win. Here in verse 35, again the next day after John stood and two of his disciples, and looking upon Jesus as he walked, he saith, Behold the Lamb of God. Christ is the one who is anointed. He's anointed by the Spirit of God, he is the Messiah. And when John spoke those words, the two disciples that were with him, they followed Christ. Who else would they follow? He's the one that the nation has been waiting for. And John was his forerunner. And he had been manifested to him. Now he's about to be made known unto the men that God the Father would give him. So they set out behind him. There's no need for John to have disciples any longer. Because the one in whom he had ran for, he is here. And beloved... That's one of the, the dangers within the pastoral ministry is to have people who will follow us rather than follow Christ. In our fellowship, I've made it known and with repetition that you are not my disciples, that you are disciples of the Lord Jesus Christ just like I am. I am a sheep just like you are. And once again, the danger is, is that when we have people who will follow us because of whatever the reason may be, we'll find ourselves saying things that we should not, doing things that we, we should not, figuring that they're going to follow us no matter what. But the truth be told, they should be following Christ. And the Apostle Paul put it this way, Follow me as a follow Christ. Paul knew his place. And he knew the place of the Lord Jesus Christ. And he never deflected attention from him. He always pointed the church in that direction. Sinners in his direction as well. They set out to follow Jesus. Then Jesus turned and saw them following and saith unto them, What seek ye? And they said unto him, Rabbi, which is to say, being interpreted, Teacher, where dwelleth thou? I would imagine that this was an awkward moment because the Lord knew that they were following him. And, and was it 
perhaps like with Peter and and John and when they were on the Mount of Transfiguration when Peter didn't know what to say. But they came out and said, we wanted to know where, where you dwell. I believe the reason they said that is because we want to go where you're going. That, that's where we're headed. But we really want to know where you stay. Because we plan to, to be there with you. These future preachers. Future evangelists. That they have set out to follow the preacher extraordinaire. As we said on yesterday. The herald from heaven. The one who was sent by God the Father. And the Lord said unto them. Come and see. And they came and they saw where he dwelt. And abode with him that day. For it was about the tenth hour. Obviously, this is a little different than evangelism, but there are some points that we can glean. Messiah has been identified. John's disciples, these two, are, are following him. We have been saved, and, and Christ is not only our Savior, but he's our Lord. And in the ministry of Christ, he's preparing us, each one of us. You've been saved. He's given you gifts. You have at least one gift. And it's for you to use that gift. Having the Spirit of God use that gift through you. Christ knew the purpose of these men following him. But there were others who followed him for other reasons. Here in, let's go to Matthew. Matthew chapter seven. We find ourselves here in this passage a great deal. But it's unfortunate. There are going to be some people who thought that they were saved. Claim that they were Christians and that they followed Christ. Only to find out that that was not the case. Matthew chapter 7 and verse 21. Not everyone that saith unto me, Lord, Lord, shall enter into the kingdom of heaven. So salvation is more than a confession. It, it's more than a say-so salvation. It, it's all right to say so after you're saved. In another place, the Lord said, Why call ye me Lord, Lord, and do not the things that I say? Lord, Lord. I hear that a lot in the church. Everybody and their brother calling on the Lord, Lord. The Lord has said this. The Lord is doing that. And if that's the case, that's wonderful. But in this case, these individuals are going to find out the one that they have been calling Lord, Lord, that he's never been their Lord. And they have never been his disciples. But he that doeth the will of my father which is in heaven. Someone posed the question. They wanted to know, well, what do we have to do to do the work of God? Well, the work of God is to believe 
on the Lord Jesus Christ. It is to obey God. Many will say to me in that day, Lord, Lord, have we not prophesied in thy name? And in thy name have cast out demons, and in thy name done many wonderful works. These individuals here, they've been working, they've been serving. But notice what the Lord says here in verse 23. And then will I profess unto them, I never knew you. Can, can you imagine hearing those words after this life and all that transpires, all of the difficulty, all of the things that go wrong, but only to live this life and leave and find out that the Lord has something different to say to you and to me. I posed this question, perhaps last year. What if the Lord hasn't called me to preach? Man, what if he hasn't called me to pastor? What if I'm not saved? I'm in trouble. Because it doesn't matter what I believe, do, or say, that's not going to change my present situation. And therefore, we need to know in whom we have truly believed. We need to know that we are saved beyond a shadow of a doubt. And that our works should commend our salvation. But beloved, if you're not saved, it will not save us. And we have folk here that they are raising up before the Lord what they've done as a banner. Oh, foretelling others, casting out demons, others doing many wonderful works. Christ summed up all of their works in this verse right here, in verse 23. And then will I profess unto them, I never knew you. We were never intimate. You weren't like the thief on the cross. No, no, not that one. Not, not the one who railed on me and kept on railing on me. No, I'm talking about the one who saw the light enough to desire more light. When he was in the, the very presence of the, the light of the world. And he believed that the Lord Jesus would be raised from the dead after his death. The Lord is saying to these folk who are braggadocious and making claims over their work. That was the relationship with him. They had a works relationship. But they didn't have a relationship like father, son, and he, Christ being our Lord, and, and, and we're being his servants. He owns us. They didn't have that relationship. He said, I, I never knew you. And these words will, will crush the spirit, break hearts. And, and these words are, the Lord will not be able to take them back. Nor will he have any desire to take them back. Because the text goes on to say, ye that work iniquity. That's the sum total of all of what you've done in my name, made all of these claims, you did it 
and you did this work out of your own nature, out of your fallenness, not even having your sins forgiven. You work out of your own iniquity. You may have done a lot of things to help a lot of people, but in the final analysis, Through here, these individuals, there's no remedy for them because they had a work salvation. And now it's too late to be saved. That was another crowd in John chapter 6. In verse 25, and when they had found him on the other side of the sea, they said unto him, Master, whence cameth thou hither? And Jesus answered them and said, Verily, verily, I say unto you, you seek me, not because you saw the miracles. The miracles were performed that when you sought me, you might believe on me that I am the Christ, that you would be seeking me for my works that no man has ever done. But he said, you saw the miracles, but no, but because ye did eat of the loaves and were filled. That's why you're looking for me. And beloved, evangelism, if, if we're going to win the loss, there has to be follow up to see where those who have made a profession of faith, where they are. If they are in a good Bible church, if that when you run across them again, prayerfully, that they are singing God's praises. And they want to tell you about all of these different experiences that they're having with the Lord. You know how it was with you. You were walking and it was as if you, your feet weren't even hitting the ground. It's when the Lord was speaking to you by his word. And you sense that you are always in his presence. You kind of leaned in thinking that you were his favorite. Follow up to those in whom we have shared the gospel and that they have made a profession of faith. But this crowd were here. They were just following him because of the fact that they were getting their bellies full. Labor not for the meat which perisheth, but for that meat which endureth unto everlasting life which the Son of Man shall give unto you, for him have God the Father sealed. Then said they unto him, What shall we do that we might work the works of God? This is the verse we alluded to. Jesus answered and said unto them. And this is all that the crowd back over there in Matthew 7, all they had to do was believe on the Lord Jesus, believe into him. Press into him. That's what Christ said in Luke 16. John was up until the point where the gospel was preached and men press into it. The poor had the gospel preached to them. John 1. And we have one of the disciples. And this is what evangelism should look like. Where you've spent time with the Lord. 
And the next thing you know, you go find someone else. I know this has an apostolic setting here. But this is how it should work. That once you're saved, you, you go looking for a family member. You go looking for your brother, your sister, your, your cousin. One of the two which heard John speak followed him was Andrew, Simon Peter's brother. He first findeth his own brother, Simon, and saith unto him, We have found the Messiah, which is being interpreted, the Christ. This is a, a picture of what evangelism looks like. Once we have been one to Christ ourselves, that we go out and we reach someone that we know a family member, someone close or someone distant. Beloved, what does our union with Christ look like? Are you able to, I know obviously you're saved, you're able to see Christ in others. Now, if you're not saved, you're not going to necessarily be able to see Christ in others. You're going to miss him the same way you've missed him in salvation. You'll see someone that you may deem as gifted or talented. But have you recognized Christ in you? The hope of glory? See, in order to win souls, you, first you must have been one yourself. So these next few observations should help you and me, especially those who perhaps you just were saved, to see where you are. Does the world and society that orbit, that sphere of influence, do they recognize that you are a disciple of the Lord Jesus Christ? Do they recognize that? Is that obvious to them? Or do they just sense you just go to church? The illustration I used yesterday I said, let's go along with this. All of you are able to scuba dive, and I'm the only one that can. So you can go out into the ocean and go out deep and go down and stay a while because you know how. But since I don't know how to scuba dive, I just say, well, I go to the beach. Going to the beach and being a scuba diver, that's two different things. Being a disciple of Jesus Christ and just going to church, two different things. In Matthew chapter 26, our Lord is making his rounds, and I say this reverently, through this kangaroo court and Peter, Mr. Man, he's going to follow the Lord. Peter had no business following the Lord. This is a case where he was not supposed to follow the Lord because God would smite the shepherd and the flock would be scattered. What does that mean? Go home. No, Peter, I'm going to go with you. I'm going to die with you. Verse 6 and 9, now Peter sat without in the palace, and a maid or damsel came unto him, saying, Thou also was with Jesus of Galilee. Thus folk out there in the, in the world, people that know you and know of you, can they make this statement about you? Or do they see you as a, a church child? You a church, you a church girl, you a church boy. 
You have more allegiance to the church than you do the Christ of the one church. And we're not so much concerned with what Peter said, but he denied before them all saying, I, I know not what thou sayest. And when he was gone out into the porch, another maid saw him and said unto them that were there, this fellow was also with Jesus Nazareth. They saw Peter with Christ and with the other disciples. Now, people not want to be able to ever see us with Christ because the spirit of Christ. He's with us, but yet no one can see him. But do they sense that? That you are his disciple. And that you may not necessarily believe and subscribe to everything that the local New Testament church subscribes to. Or are you just a good church member? Whatever the church tell you, that's what you believe. Whatever your denomination believes, that's what you're going to go with. Finally, and after a while came unto him, they that stood by and said to Peter, surely thou art one of them, for thy speech betrayeth thee. I remember when I spent a little time up in New York, when I worked a previous job, and by me being on the furthest in of the uh, distribution centers, we were the furthest one south, and I guess I had the southern draw. They knew that I was from Virginia. They could just tell you, you're from Virginia. Well, in this case, Peter, in his speech, but what about your language today? What you say and how you say it. You know, what you say and how you say it is, they're, they're almost one and the same. You can say the right thing. You, you, you just, you, you got it. You can say the right thing the wrong way. But would your speech implicate you as a disciple of Jesus Christ down at the courthouse? Or would folks see you as a rebel? That you are Hades raiser. And all you have going for you is uh, the badge of church membership. What about the religious world? What about the religious world? Do they recognize you as a servant of Christ? That you've spent time with him and time well spent. Turn, if you would, to Acts. Acts chapter 4. And we're going to pick it up at verse number 1. And it's going to be a rather long read, but uh, hopefully it will serve the purpose. And always the reading of God's word serves its purpose. Verse number one. And as they spake unto the people, the priest and the captain of the temple and the Sadducees came unto them. And this is Peter and John being grieved that they taught the people and preached through Jesus, the resurrection from the dead. And that's the cornerstone. He's the cornerstone of the church, but that's the cornerstone message. And they laid hands on them and put them in a hole unto the next day, for it was now even time. Howbeit many of them which heard the word believed, and the number of the men was about 5,000. And it came to pass on tomorrow that their rulers and elders and scribes and Annas, the high priest, and Caiaphas, and John, and Alexander, and as many as were of the kindred of the high priest were gathered together at Jerusalem, Verse 7, and when they had set them in the midst, they asked by what power or by what name have you done this? I want to drop down to verse 11. 
This is the stone because Peter gets an opportunity to speak and we're going to come back to that. This is the stone which was set at naught of the builders, which has become the head of the corner. Neither is there salvation in any other, for there is none other name uh, under heaven given among men whereby we must be saved. Now when they saw the boldness of Peter and John and perceived that they were, watch this, they were unlearned. They perceived that they were unlearned prior to something happening. They were just ignorant men, ignorant citizens. They didn't know much. They were like you before Jesus Christ. They were like me. Oh, I thought I knew more than everyone else, but I found out what I knew was just enough to get me a straight ticket to hell and perceived that they were ignorant and unlearned men, they marveled and took knowledge of them that they had been with Jesus. <laughs> Beloved, are you a part of the religious order yourself? Because you rub elbows with them, you drink with them, you drink bourbon with them, you smoke with them, you talk with them, you hang out with them, you party with them. Or are you exclusively by virtue of the fact that you are with Christ, they, they identify you as being with Messiah. And you've spent time and you've learned some things that you could have never known. You don't even talk like you used to talk. No, you don't walk like you used to walk. You don't go to the same places you used to run to. Is that your story? Do religious folk, when they see you are coming, are they concerned? Do you remind them of the Christ? You see, in a lot of these religious settings between all of the isms within the church, and I don't, I don't, I don't really feel like calling them out tonight. I don't, I don't like to think that every time that I come, folk can figure out what he's going to say. <laughs> I want to be led and guided by the Spirit. But with all other vested interested interests within the church that has nothing to do with God, his Christ, the Spirit of God, and the Word of God, do you make folk who are entrenched in that stuff, do you make them nervous? Would they rather not be around you lest you, they put you in a corner and, and say something and next thing you know, you, the Spirit of God gives you what to say and once you say it, an hour later, you don't even know what you said because it was the Spirit of God in you speaking and addressing them. See, we have what's going on within the church a whole lot of, I, I'm going to speak my mind. I'm going to say what I want to say. Okay. You can do that in a place where the spirit of God is, is not, you're not sensitive to the spirit of God. I said this yesterday. You can't say everything you think. A microphone is one of the worst things ever created, if it's going to cause you to come out of your character if you're saved. Those who've heard me minister, I'll drag breaks. I'll say, and I'm right, I'm right in the fly of saying something, and then I said, no, I can't say that. Say, I got to tell Dennis, no, you can't say that. But that's the prompting. I got to check in my spirit. What I'm getting ready to say, not going to move the needle. It's not going to advance the kingdom. It may make me feel better about myself. It may, you know, make me puff my head up. But it doesn't do anything for someone who's having a rough time in their life. And they're born again, they're saved. Might even turn them off. And tell that you've been in the presence 
of the Lord Jesus Christ. Let me ask you this, and this is where we're going to close. Do you recognize when you are full of the Holy Ghost? Now, the scripture says, be not drunk with wine, wherein is excess, but be filled with the Spirit. How do you know when you are filled with the Spirit? Have you sensed when you are filled with the Spirit of God? I remember when I first started preaching publicly in the church. It didn't matter how much I cry out to God for His Spirit to, to fill me. I never sensed it until I was in the moment. Every time I've ever approached walking up to that sacred desk, as we called it, because it's been set aside in most places for the gospel, for the glory of God, that I never experienced it until I needed him the most. It's when I opened my mouth and sometimes I didn't even know what I was going to say. Even when there were times when I had memorized long portions of scripture. It's when you sense his presence and you sense him leading you and guiding you, directing you. That's his ministry. He'll guide us into all truth. We look back here at verse number five. And we're going to drop down to verse seven. They, they're asking Peter and John. And when they had sat them in the midst, they asked, by what power or by what name have ye done this? You want to know how did this miracle happen? Then Peter, filled with the Holy Ghost. See, Peter not full of himself. Beloved, we're talking about evangelizing. We're talking about perfecting the saints. If you full of yourself, that's going to be an impediment. That's going to make it hard to evangelize the lost if you full of you. No, when it comes to ministry, we have to be empty, so to speak, sensitive to the presence of God, sensitive to the audience of one. Peter opened his mouth. He was filled with the Holy Ghost. Now, what does that mean to be filled with the Holy Ghost? When you are filled with the Holy Spirit, you are being led by the Spirit, but you're also following Christ because you are exactly where Christ wants you. The Spirit is there to aid you, empower you. And I'm sure, and I'm, I want to be careful how I say this, is that when Peter spoke, it was almost as if Christ was speaking. I'm not minimizing our Savior. But you have to remember, Christ was the Son of God, but he was also the Son of Man. And he was the anointed one. And here Peter is, and see, it gave Peter, the Spirit of God, he, the Spirit of God, gave Peter such boldness. His persecutors were there. Those who despised him and hated his master called him a heretic. Called Jesus after his death, burial, and resurrection went to Pilate and said, well, uh, Pilate, uh, you remember when that deceiver talking about Christ. That's what the religious order thought of Christ. 
That's what they think of him today. That's what they think of his slaves. All of a sudden, Peter has the whole council around him. <laughs> I don't know if Peter knew how this thing was going to work out, but I grant you when he opened his mouth, he sensed that God was with him. And it was. It was a God, the Spirit. And the Lord Jesus Christ was present. And God, the Father, he's looking in on this. God had these men right where he wanted them. Listen to this. You want to know by what power? Well, that's answered in verse 8. Then Peter filled with the Holy Ghost. The same power that fills the church. Every member can be filled with the Holy Spirit. But I'll tell you something. He's not going to do much with us. If we're not living clean, he can't use no foul vessel. He can't, and, and he doesn't use someone who's nasty and dirty. He's the Holy Spirit for heaven's sake. You remember Aaron and two sons? And they went up and they offered, we could call it an act of worship, they offered strange fire. Fire that the Lord didn't recognize because they did not follow instructions. It's been a while since I looked at that. I heard someone say, I wonder had they been drinking. I wonder what was their consecration like or the lack thereof. See, we can't just run up into God's house with a sheet of adultery hanging out from behind us. And fornication, and hatred in our heart, and bitterness in our spirit, and angry. Yet we're going to go up to God's house and we're going to serve. Or we want to witness to someone. Spirit of God, he's not going to be in that. Because he is the Holy Spirit. See, we don't control him. To be filled with the Spirit means that He has us right where He wants us. He wants all of us when it's time to minister the Word of God. Your testimony is instrumental. But the gospel, that's the seed. That's the Word of God. And when Peter opened his mouth, they found out where the power... Can you... Imagine what it was like to hear someone that you've already written off. They're not on your level. They're not from the same side of the tracks as you. Oh, okay, here it is. Someone who didn't finish high school because they dropped out around the seventh grade. And you went on and you got your doctorate. They, you know, economically, they, they don't measure up to your financial situation. But all of a sudden, you are in their presence, and when they open their mouth, wow! These men, they were under the power of the Holy Ghost speaking. And see, here's, here it is right here. Here it is. Here it is. When you are filled with the Spirit of God, it's not what you want to say, it's what He is going to say. Because you already know He has omniscience. You can't strip it the way you want it. You can't work it the way that you might like it. You can't make folk feel something in their flesh while you're supposed to be preaching the gospel. I call it cute preaching. But you're trying to draw folk to you. You want folk enamored with you. 
No, here it is. Is that folk sense the, the presence of the Lord. I heard this on a couple of occasions. The party was preaching. And, and, and this individual was under the, the power of the Spirit of God and said that the person leaped up and ran out of the church because they sensed the presence of God and they knew that they needed to get right, but they weren't going to get right. They sensed the presence of God. The sister of that same individual said the same thing. It's when conviction comes about. When you know you're not right with God. And yet the church will attempt to clean you like you fish you've been caught. But you ain't been caught and they'll spend their time calling you. Well, good to see you, sister so-and-so. Good to see you, brother so-and-so. You show up at Bible study, you a brother. You show up to church school, you a brother. And you a bit more brother than the man in the moon. Because you live like the devil. Let me tell you something about the devil. The devil knows. He knows his time is winding up and that his time is short. Do you think that he believes somehow, some way, he's going to be able to get around Jesus Christ and the sword that he has in his mouth, which is the word of God? He knows where he's going. But, oh God, he will have you deceived thinking that you on your way to heaven when you on your way to hell with him. We all going to spend eternity with our daddy. Our father, our heavenly father, or the one whom Christ said, that when he speaks, he, he speaks a lie. He was a liar from the beginning. And the truth abideth not in him. He'll make you think you on your way to heaven. And he dragging you right down into hell. Why? Because you're yet in the world. Yet you're still dead in trespasses and in sins. You're still lost in darkness. The church will make you think you right with God. Know how you live it. See how you party. See how the things you do. And watch this. And things you don't do. That you don't subscribe to the word of God. Or you may have a pet scripture. Or you may like, you might have a favorite book. Peter. Listen to what Peter says. Then Peter filled with the Holy Ghost said unto them, ye rulers of the people and the elders of Israel. He's calling out everyone. Listen how the Spirit of God speaks. Peter couldn't put this together. If we this day be examined of the good deed done to the impotent man by what means he has made whole, be it known unto you all and to all the people of Israel that by the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, whom ye crucified, whom God raised from the dead, even by him doeth this man stand here before you. And that's when he went and said the other. So what it means to be filled with the Spirit of God, it means to be led by the Spirit of God. For they that are led by the Spirit of God, they are the sons of God. Those who are not led by the Spirit of God and never been led by the Spirit of God, not children of God. It's that simple. But see, the church won't tell you this. Sometimes it's a dime on a dollar. Sometimes they don't know any better. Sometimes they just go based on what you say without any follow-up. I'll ask folk, I say, how, how you doing? And I look them right in the eyes. I'm looking right into the pupil. How you doing? I'm, I'm fine, I'm fine. How, how you doing? 
Now I know the Spirit of God is on me. He's in me. And, and, and you can see them just kind of like a prune. They go from being a, like a grape to go to being a prune. And I'll tell you what it is. Well, you may have to pry a little bit to get it out. Eternity too long. Heaven, it, according to the scriptures, and you know God hasn't told us everything. It's, it's, it's too blissful. Hell too hot. Too dark. To spend it on a technicality. That you want to win souls, but who going to win you to Christ? I hope this message, many of you who are watching, I can't see who you are uh, necessarily. But for those who may log on, I pray this message will help you. I'll never forget a funeral that I preached. And I gave the I gave the invitation like I saw my former pastor give it. He he had preached, I mean he had preached himself. He was, I mean, he was soaking wet. I mean, I, I'm telling you, he had preached the gospel. And he had everyone stand. And he said, if you saved, you know you saved, I want you to take your seat. I took my seat along with my wife. And only a few other people took the seat. I'm looking at his leadership shaking their head. Like the deer caught in the headlights. It shocked him. He told me about it because we talked about it. I brought it up one night. He, he said he couldn't believe it. Then he rephrased it. Everyone sat down. I preached a funeral. And I did the same thing. I was in the same place. The place was full. About a third of the church was remaining. I'm looking at deacons, leaders, folk who've been in church all of their life. My sister was there. And she said, she said, Dennis, I wanted to be saved again. She sensed the presence of God, the power of the Spirit of God. Well, it would have been awkward to get all of them down front around a casket. I, I, I just thought about that just now. So when I prayed afterward and, and asked them to come forward, only a few came forward. One party who was a part of the search committee in the church. See, this is what I'm telling you all. You, you own the, you own the search committee and you not saved. I'm, I'm talking about folk on their way to hell playing church, playing games, playing Russian roulette. With their soul. Went to another church. I did the same thing. I think three people sat down. rest of the church standing up. No one came forward. No one. The guy who. <laughs> was there. Looking to. Take the church, because at this time they didn't have a pastor. He was the first one to call me bishop, and I didn't let it go to my head. I didn't. It didn't mean, it didn't mean anything coming from him, because I knew why he was there. He was hanging around for a job. 
But this is what he said. He said, I, I know these people. They, they all right with God. Okay. I went to another church. I don't know how I did it. But anyhow, we had a, and this was like a deacons and deaconess celebration. I preached. I had, mm, can't say that. No amens, no nothing. Place literally full. Folk came forward. Their pastor was there. Now watch this. Watch this. I said, uh, I went through whatever I went through. I can't remember all of it and all. And I turned it over to him. You want to know what he got up and did? He sat there and he looked at folk who were ushers and leaders and what have you. And he grinned and he said this. I know all y'all saved. You know what I felt like doing? Hey, hey, honey, my wife was like that. I said, babe, come on, let's go. I, I had my robe on. I was preaching in my robe at that time. I should have got my wife and left. You're going to sit there and going to tell me the spirit has moved. It wasn't a celebratory message. Matter of fact, one of the ladies and, and two of them came to me and said, and they said, did you notice us today? I said, how so? We, 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 we didn't say a word. No one said anything. I would venture to say that one of the greatest mission fields is within what we call the framework of organized religion. Well, beloved, I want to thank you all who are live with us. I'm going to wave at you. I don't, don't know who all is out there. And certainly for those of you who will tune in at the appointed time. Well, beloved, we wanted to get session five up. Uh, Lord willing, hopefully we'll come back on Wednesday night with Ephesians uh, chapter two. We, uh, we didn't upload a message last Wednesday, so we're a little off between our in-person session and the media ministry, but it, we, we're going to, Lord willing, hopefully we'll get it all up uh, and, and it may be a little delayed, uh, but I like to try to keep them together. It's easier for me, but anyhow, be that as it may. But I want to thank you all for, for joining. Let's just have a word of prayer. Eternal Father in heaven, I want to thank you for these moments in which we have shared with you, true believers, uh, men and women, uh, those who are saved, young people, Lord, who, who may hear this message, Lord. I, I just thank you, Lord, for, for drawing them to hear uh, this evangelistic message. And Father, we've put the inspection upon ourselves that the Lord Jesus Christ is, he's going to ultimately, he's inspecting us now. And, and one day we want to hear, well done, thy good and faithful servant. We're not all going to hear that. Some are going to hear. The ones who have talk, always talking about Lord, 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 Lord. They're going to hear something different. So, Father, I'm praying that this message and these series would serve two purposes. Not only to perfect the church, that we would be equipped. Help us to evangelize the lost. But that someone who's lost, Lord, would become born again. That they become saved. That they would believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. He's the one who's tasted death. And he is the one who is the only remedy for sin, a sin-sick soul. So, Father, I thank you and I pray for anyone who's watching this who don't know you, that tonight would be a good night to give uh, their life to the Lord Jesus. Father, I pray that your spirit would convict them of their sin. And I mean sin because they have yet to believe on the Lord Jesus and of righteousness because really they don't have any righteousness of their own because you're not taking in any dirty laundry because our Lord Jesus has ascended back to you in a judgment because you have judged the prince of this world. And since you've judged the one who has the world deceived that you're going to actually 
have to and you must judge those who remained in deception, even religious deception. So, Father, I'm praying, Father, for them that they would obey the gospel, that they'd be as the apostle Paul. And Paul said, I was not disobedient to the heavenly vision that I heard Christ and I obeyed him. May it, might it be so, Lord. So we want to thank you, Father, for what it is you are doing and thank you for what it is you're going to do. In Christ Jesus' name, we give you all the praise, glory, and honor. In Christ Jesus' name, amen. Well, beloved, thank you so much for tuning in. And, and until next time, be blessed.